So that's uh, 2 Chronicles 26, verses 11 through 15, and then we'll go to chapter 29 next. So chapter 26, 11 through 15, here we go. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men that went out to war, to war by bands. According to the number of their account, by the hand of Jeel the scribe, and Maaseah the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains, the whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host shields and spears and helmets and harbingers and bows and slings to cast stones. So this harbinger is what the other translations believe is like a coat of mail, kind of like body armor, okay? Uh, and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. I like the way the NASB says it. It says machines of war. And he made in Jerusalem engines or machines of war invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones with all. And his name spread far abroad for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Now let's go ahead and turn to chapter 29 of the same book, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And we're going to read verses 27 through 29. So that was Uzziah. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. And all the congregation worshiped and the singers sang and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they had made an end of offering, the king and all that were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. Now we're going to turn to chapter 30, and we're going to read verse 1, and it looks like verse 5. And Hezekiah, oh, let's, let's just wait a second, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 1. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. Verse 5. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. Look at this. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. Not, uh, just to make it interesting for you, I was realizing the other day when I got to, uh, I also read into the story of Josiah and he held a Passover and they said the way he held the Passover it had not been done like that since way back to the prophet Solomon. All right. So that's just kind of interesting that the children of Israel were not really engaging in the Passover all that time the way that they were supposed to. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 31 and we'll read verses five, six and seven. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, and all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep, and the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated unto the Lord their God. Verse 7. In the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. All right. Going to chapter 32. We're getting close. This is going to be the last passage I'll read before we get started in the message. Second Chronicles chapter 32 verses 3 
and then five through eight. All right. He took counsel. We're still talking about Hezekiah. He took counsels, counsel with his princes and his mighty men. To Now, let, let me give you a little context here, because what we did was we just read a good bit of information about Hezekiah was doing a whole lot of good things. Right. He was preparing his people for war. Uh, and, and he had the people willing to bring their tithes. He had reinstituted the Passover. So he's following the word of the Lord and he's wanting the people of God to worship God the way God had put into the word. Amen. Amen. And then now, but what I want you to see right here, though, is that he's about to face some trial. He's about to face some trial and some tribulation. If you read the whole chapter, you'd probably really kind of get a little bit sick to your stomach. If you hear what King Sennacherib from Assyria says and does and starts calling out the God of Israel. But let's go ahead. I'm going to probably read some of it to you. So it says he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains, which were without the city. And they did Help him. Now, what's interesting about that is this, is that that was an act of war. He knew that his enemy was coming out of him. And listen, I don't know much about military strategy, but I do know this. If you have an army and you don't have water, uh-oh, you're in trouble. And so that's what he was doing. He was damming up the spring. He was damming up the river to prevent his enemy that he knew was on the way from being able to have access to water. So you can see he's doing everything that he can in the physical, practically, and logically, and I'm just going to kind of leave it uh, like right there for a second, but then we're going to read verses 5 through 8. Also, he strengthened himself up and built up all the wall that was broken. He raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo in the city of David and made darts and shields in abundance. And he set captains of war over the people. Well, right now, he doesn't know his enemy's coming. Right now, he's just preparing the kingdom. He's doing the right thing. He's being... He's, he's doing what's right, right? He's getting ready for warfare in case somebody comes to attack him. <clears throat> and he sent captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city and spoke comfortably to them saying, oh yeah, he does know the king's coming, sorry. This was a early morning thing that just happened. Okay. Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. Now he's going to bring in the spiritual. Amen. Amen. Because he says, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battle. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And so... I'm not going to read the rest of it right now, but I will tell you that, that the Assyrian king, well, you know what? Let's just go ahead and read some of this. Let's go ahead. After this, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants to Jerusalem, but he himself laid siege against another city. And then going down to verse 10, thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Now, this is his, his little servant, man, his little mouthpiece speaking this to the children of Israel. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, whereon do you trust that you abide in the siege in Jerusalem? In other words, they're staying in the city. They're refusing to come out. They're, they're listening to the words of their king and they're trusting. And they said, you know what? It makes sense. He said that God is with us. He said that God will be our strength. We're going to trust the king. We're, going to, we're not going out there because the enemy's out there. We're going to stay right here where it's safe. This wasn't part of my message. But when we stay in Christ, hallelujah, when we stay in Christ, when we stay in the faith, whenever we walk in the spirit, when we stay true to the word of the Lord, when we, we let the Holy Spirit lead us and we don't venture outside of the will of God, hallelujah, we now are safe in Christ and the Lord, it doesn't matter how bad it looks. Listen to me, child of God. The last thing you want to do when the trial starts coming, when the enemy starts coming, the last thing you want to do is step outside the city walls of protection and go back out there where you were before. Because now you're going to open yourself up from an attack of the enemy. And you don't want to open yourself up to an attack of the enemy. It's not going to get better. All right. So he goes, but, but, but it, let's just keep reading. He says, doth not, and this is what the servant's saying for, for Sennacherib, doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and by thirst? Saying, the Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria. Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high place? You see, this guy didn't even understand God. 
He's, he's over here. Hezekiah done tore down the high places that they were using to serve false gods. And he's trying to clown these people for this. Right, right. He says, has not Hezekiah taken away the high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, you shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? You see how he's making fun of? You got one God. How silly is that? We've already destroyed multiple nations that had multiple gods, you foolish Jews, y'all are stuck in a city and you're going to starve yourself to death. Know you not what I and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands anyways able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly uh, destroyed? Uh, and that could deliver his people out of my hand that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand. Now, therefore, let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this man, neither yet believe him, for no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of my hand? It goes on and it gets even worse because then they start speaking. They find somebody that can speak their language. <laughs> They find somebody that can speak Hebrew and they get him over there and he starts speaking to them in their language and then they start kind of like getting a little bit nervous. Now, that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with my message till we get to the end because again, the Lord kind of spoke that to me. But So I do want to get into this message though. I want to talk to you about access. I want to talk to you about access to the presence of the Lord. Amen? So I'm just, you don't even have to try to turn with some of these scriptures, but you know, Matthew 27, 51 talks about the fact that when Jesus died and he said, it is finished, that the veil was ripped from the top to the bottom. We know that Josephus, the Jewish historian said that two yoke of oxen couldn't have pulled that apart, that it was actually woven or embroidered with thread. And, and, but the Lord ripped it apart is what he did. Amen. And, and, and you know what that signifies in Hebrews? It talks about the fact that he made a new and a living way for us to be able to enter in and to enter in into God's presence. Amen. Through the veil, which is his flesh. That means that Jesus died when he died on the cross. Hallelujah. He opened up the way for you and I to be able to have access into the presence of of the Holy God. You and I can have intimate relationship with the ancient of days. That may not mean a lot to you. I don't know. But it should. Okay. And, and I'm going to probably talk a little bit about that. But what, you know, let's just talk a little bit about, about the, uh, the presence. And Psalm chapter 16, it says this. You will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, this is the part most people leave off, but I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We have access to the presence of the living God. Amen? Amen. The Lord wants, he desires that we would draw near him in prayer and worship. I want you to know that. It seems reasonable. It seems like a reasonable service considering the fact that Jesus died so that we could enter into the presence of the Lord, so that we could have access. So it seems reasonable that we would worship the king, that we would try to enter his presence, right? That it makes sense that we would worship him in church. It makes sense that we would be excited to be just knowing if we believe. And listen, there's been times I've been in worship services that I haven't been as excited as what I should have been. But hallelujah, he's worthy. I know we've been talking about that. He's worthy no matter what we're going through. Jace, you believe that, right? He's worthy. He's worthy to be worshipped, to be magnified, even whenever things aren't going the way I want them to. Right. Hallelujah. Even whenever people are quibbling or whatever the right word is, in the house. Quarreling, quibbling, you know, that you can use that word too. Yeah, and squabbling or something like that. All them words. They're over there getting getting on each other's nerves and things are going bad and all. He's still worthy to be magnified. Sometimes we gotta tell ourselves like the psalmist did, amen. Oh soul, why are you downcast within me? Speak to your own soul, man. You're privileged. You're privileged because you know that Jesus died for you. You're privileged if you're born again tonight. You're privileged to be 
in a church where the presence of the Lord, I don't take this for granted, my friend. The presence of the Lord, it might not be as full as I want it, but hallelujah. They might start sending people in here that don't feel the same way you do. And they don't want to work with the Lord. And then all of a sudden, we don't feel the presence like we are. Send the right ones, Lord. And if they're not on fire, at least send the ones that are ready to catch on fire. Amen. I just want the presence of the Lord. But he said, if you'll draw near me, I'll draw near you. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians says this. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Hallelujah. Now let me ask you something. From what you've learned so far in your walk with God. Some of you have been walking with the Lord for at least a little while. And if you haven't been walking with the Lord for a while, you're already starting to learn it if you've been with him for any length of time. He didn't probably give you everything that you were wanting right away. He probably didn't give you all the revelation that you were looking for right away. I'm learning more and more that there's a process to everything. Right. And as soon as I think that I'm ready, the Holy Spirit says, hold on, boy, you ain't ready yet. I still got some things I got to show you. And as soon as I think I got revelation on the things that he's been trying to show me, I realize I didn't know near quite as much as what I thought I did. Come on. I'm just being real with you. Yeah. So what I have learned is that it's kind of more like that song. <laughs> Y'all know. I got to try to sing. I sang at the church today, by the way. I did. I mean, not the church. The jail. I sang at the jail today. Yeah, I did. I don't even remember what I sang. But it, it, something hit me and I started singing. Hallelujah. One dude raised his hands. All right. It was like all song that he probably knew from when he was a little boy. He raised his hands and he said, I'm going to worship the Lord in front of them other 12 men. Hallelujah. Praise God. And you know I can't sing. You know, it's, uh, and the Holy Spirit was in there. The Holy Spirit was in there and he was ministering to people. I'm going to tell you that right now. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I told him too. I said, yeah, y'all can come to my church. Just don't talk to the women. <laughs> I know that's legit. You can come to my church. Don't talk to the women. Or don't be trying to hit on the women for sure. Right? I said, because I'm, I did not say so. It was probably flesh. I did. I said, because I'm, I may not be able to beat you. I don't know. But if I don't, I will seek the Holy Spirit. I'll be messing with them women in the church. But you are welcome. In the house of God. Amen? Amen. All right. I know that's appropriate. Amen. That's just pastoring. Right. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Help me out. Help me out. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So it's kind of more like that song. The more I seek you, the more I find you. Yes. Amen? Yes. So it's like he never gives it to me all at once. But like James said, if I'll draw near him, he will draw near me. Right? So knowing that the veil is torn, my next, I have a question. Have you entered in? Yeah. That's a good question. I'm, I know these people in here have, I ask you on video. Have you entered in? Knowing that he paid such a high price, knowing that God the Father bankrupted in heaven of its most prized possession, and that God himself became man to pay the sin debt, a debt, oh, that's what I'm saying today. He paid a debt. Yes. Yeah. He did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. My Jesus paid a debt that I could never That you owe to yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. And so I'm just asking, like, knowing that he did that, knowing that he tore the veil through his flesh, knowing that you have access into the grace of God, into the presence of the Lord, have you entered in? Yes. Praise God. Yes. Scripture in Romans chapter 5 says, Now having peace with God through faith. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, 
we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Yes. Amen. I happened to talk to at least one earthling today. That was funny. I talked to Bill. That's my new thing. I told her, I told a couple of people, that's my new, my wife doesn't even know. That's my New Year's resolution. I know it's not even New Year. I don't even believe in New Year's <laughs> But this is my new thing. Talk less to earthlings and more to God. <laughs> Hallelujah! So don't be feeling weird if you don't get a phone call. I'm going to talk less to earthlings. And that doesn't include you, baby. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that. <laughs> you know, that doesn't include you, my lovely one. I'm talking about other earthlings. And that doesn't include you, baby. Which are good. It sounds good, right? Okay. But it is true, right? I mean, you talked about five earthlings in a day, man. <laughs> like, dude, they just start throwing that stuff on you. You can, like, walk around like, you don't need up. Hallelujah, I need to talk to you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. You know, the now form of this access word I did, I talked to Bill earlier, and I thought he'd get a kick out of it because he used to be a count. And with the word access in the noun, in the noun form, it actually describes coming into a harbor. And I was trying to use some words that I had read in a book and I didn't even know if they were right and come to find out they were kind of right. I was, and I told a little story, kind of like the wind, like the chronicles of a captain. You're looking at a captain's log, right? And, and the, the leeward winds were hitting us on this side. And so we came around to the the starboard side. <laughs> or we turned to the, I don't know what we did, but we came back in around where they had created a harbor that was free from the from the, the way that the winds and the waves would crash upon the other shore. And there we gained access into the harbor, the haven, the harbor of haven, yes. safety. Jesus died on the cross to give you and I access to the grace of God. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. See, it's the grace in which we stand. Yes. Hallelujah. Grace is more than just forgiveness. Yes. Grace is power. So we have, been, uh, we have been granted access. We have been given peace. The veil is torn. And he said to Jeremiah, when you seek me with all of your heart, yes. you will find me. So access is a major aspect of the work of the cross. Through the cross and our being made right in the eyes of God, we can seek him and enter his presence. But again, do we? When we get in there, do we ask him? One of those messages I preached recently. When we get into his presence, do we ask him to search our hearts and to try our reins? I already preached on all that. But that's talking about those internal organs. Pull them out, inspect them. Take a look, Lord. Amen. Amen. And when we do that, if we do that, what does he show us? Do you want God's will for your life, for your children's lives, your family, your church? Do you want God to move through you, through us as a body even? More importantly, do you want your heart to be right before him? The Lord said on, in chapter 7 of Matthew, he said, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? I didn't know you. Depart from me. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 says this. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all his innermost parts. They sang a song earlier that talked about Psalm. It said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we put this word on the inside of us and then we let the presence of the Lord have his way and he turns on the lamp. Hallelujah. How do you reckon that the Lord works the cross into all this? How do you reckon that the Lord is going to crucify our flesh, man or woman of God, if we do not allow him to search us? Right, right. And when we do, and when he does, what do we hear? The cross works in multiple ways once we avail ourselves to access. Yes. Here's Roman numeral one. Access his presence, Isaiah chapter 6. You can't tell me that you're okay. I know, really. You can't tell me that you're okay because, look, when the mighty prophet Isaiah entered into the presence of the Lord, what did he say? Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst a people of unclean lips. Hallelujah. But the good news is, is that the Lord touched the pole to his lips. 
Because we're always going to have something new that the Lord's wanting to work on. Yes. He's just peeling it away one piece at a time. Right. Sometimes we think we're okay when in reality, we hadn't even let it get into the big Come stuff on. yet. And sometimes when we haven't let it get into the big stuff, our conscience can be seared. We need to let the Lord do business. Amen. Yes. Yes. So results of access, we get into his presence, but also grace. Grace is a result of access. Amen. We have access to the Holy Spirit. We, we, and, and look, I want to remind you that of, of this definition. And I've used it many times since I've been teaching. But one of the meanings of the word grace is that it's not just uh, forgiveness, but it's a divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Hallelujah. Well, what does that mean? That means it's, well, I'm one of my old pastors. I, I, it's not fair for me to take credit for this. Grace is an inside job. Mm. The work of the Holy Spirit is an inside job. Yeah. Whenever the Holy Spirit has his way, when we yield to him and we give him access and he begins to reveal and search our heart and he begins to try our reins and then he shows us the dross, the chaff, the things that are in our life, then guess what? We can ask him. To, that, this is what I do anyway. Lord, you got to put the cross on that. Yeah. Because you see, the cross is an instrument of death. Yeah. It's an altar. The cross is an instrument of death. And one of the other things that I'm learning is that there's two sides to the cross. Yeah. One is the death side where the old man dies. Right? Yeah. On this front side of the cross, the old man dies. And on the new side... Hallelujah. The new man is resurrected in Christ Jesus. That's Romans chapter 6. Yeah. Two sides to the cross. Yeah. One, you, you can't have the cross without the resurrection. If that's the case, you just got to, and it's okay to have a dead old man walking, but you need a alive new man walking. Yeah. You need the resurrection power of the yeah. Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised him from the dead, will also quicken or bring life to your mortal body. Yeah. See, and when the Holy Spirit's moving and, and, and I didn't want to make a rhyme right there. We're going to sound right. When the Holy Spirit's moving in your life, he will start to produce the fruit of the Spirit. In you. Yeah. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, patience, temperance, kindness, gentleness. Thank you. The fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Yeah. He will. Doesn't mean you get it right all the time. Lord knows if y'all ain't lost with me the other day, y'all know you don't get it right all the time. But Hallelujah. We can make it right. Yes. The Lord will teach us because along with this comes humility. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves. So access, grace, revelation. Because we are made right, we have access to the spirit to be our teacher. John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Thank you, Jesus. Revelation results in truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's right. That's right. Truth about God through the life of Jesus, his character. I mean, if you just turn the pages and you read the Gospels and you and you look at how Jesus handled stuff, wow. Right? How in fact I put him in up, how he handles his business. He's a he's humble. Matthew 5, 23 through 24 says that if your brother has aught against you, you're supposed to go to him. What is aught? Some, what, some, what, something, thing Jesus says, when someone has a problem with you, you go to them to make it right. That's right. What prevents people from doing that? Pride. Thank you. Preacher didn't even have to say it. He prefers others over Himself, He said in Mark, he said, the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister to others and to lay his life down as a ransom for many. He prays for people that harm him on the cross. He said, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He prays for them. And when he has to correct them, he does it privately. He goes to them and he speaks to them. At least that's what he recommends. He helps people. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to look funny. I've been practicing, but I'm not good at it because it takes me a little while to get my lips right. So y'all are going to, I'll probably not be able to do it because I'll start laughing. But. <laughs> I, it's 
sounds a lot better when y'all aren't here. <laughs> I'm over here trying to laugh. It never starts off good. Uh, so what is the point? You did that and then you said, why did you do that? Because I want y'all to see me putting money in the basket. That's what the word of God says. You blow a trumpet, that's what it says. It says it right there. Uh, and it, let me see where it says. It says it in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Ba -ba -ba! I put money in the basket. Hallelujah. It says it, that they would blow a trumpet when they put when they go to give their offering. Right, right. And then it goes on to say this. Don't let the left hand, left hand no, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Right? So, it, now that's a hard thing because, you know, look. <laughs> but but he said this. He said, because when you do that, you've already had your reward. Yeah. Yeah. Lord, help us. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So we got to get to the place, spiritually speaking, where we truly believe that when we're doing it, we're doing it unto the Lord. Yes. 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 We're giving our tithes and our offerings. We're giving our service, our time. Time is very valuable. Amen. I can tell you that I appreciate the people in this church, man. It's just amazing to me. I, listen, I know sometimes it sounds like I'm irritated when I preach. You know, it thinks maybe like I sound so overly authoritarian and overly corrective. And, but, but let me just say this. Like the other day, whenever I saw y'all hang on to the nursing home, and I saw that, I'm telling you, I was just so excited because, you know, the Lord's putting us out there in the jail, people going to the nursing home, people praying for people in Walmart, people just out there every, in their everyday lives bringing Jesus yes. out on the outside. And that's a big deal. It really is. Because, listen, I know enough about the modern church, and I'm not trying to fuss about anything, but I've been involved with some of the modern church. And plus, I've read a whole bunch of books on it. And... Um, one of the things is this, is that it, they, they judge success in a church based upon how many people are in the chair. And so what ends up happening with that is it does. It, it changes the way they preach. That's right, yeah. and, and, and I'm not saying that there's no talented guys out there. There's some really talented people. And I'm not saying that all big churches have a pastor that's not preaching the truth. I don't believe that. But, but what I am trying to say is this, is that that, that ends up happening. The message ends up being diluted, and and then and and the way that they set it up, it becomes more of a social organization yeah. Yeah. where you have internal programs that everyone's involved in, and it keeps them connected. But I believe what's happened, what we see in the Book of Acts, is we see that Jesus touches people, and they bring Jesus out into the real world. And I can tell you that just about everybody that I'm looking at in this place, I mean, except for maybe people that I don't know, are witnesses for the yes. Lord. Amen. And that's an exciting thing for me. As a pastor, I, just can't, I can't tell you how exciting it is. All right. So I like this one. He, he doesn't let other people's opinions change his mind. I rebuke you, Satan, is what he told Peter. He likes to play in the dirt. Yeah. Right? That's right. When he's over there drawing in the dirt. Yeah. When he says, you without sin cast the first stone. Yeah. He doesn't want to receive praise from men because he knows what is really in a man's heart. Yeah. People will patch on the back today and they'll try to stick a knife in it. The yeah. He told the religious, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. Mm. Come on. In the end, self is supposed to die. Christian man. And Christ arises in us. And then the question is, why doesn't it work more quickly? I mean, we could go through a whole list. Is it the drugs? Is it the alcohol? Is it the other acts of sin that are of any flavor of disobedience that we pretend isn't disobedience, but the Lord already showed us that it was wrong. And the word of God says to him that knows to do right, doesn't do it to him. It is sin. Or is it our response to what he tells us? Honestly, I believe that there's a lot of people in the church like this. And I mean, I'm sure I've been this way before. When they hear a message, they think about somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yep, that right there was for Bill. <laughs> that one is for Brendan, or it might be even for Matt's mom. <laughs> or when they pray and the Lord does speak, all right, I will tell the pastor about that one more, and I'll tell him what you showed me <laughs> about him. <laughs> He was obedient to the point of death. Have we become obedient to the point of death? Has the death of Christ entered our members to produce sanctification 
or has it remained a theory on the page? Until we yield to this great truth, it remains that, a great truth. A truth that can be trusted, a truth of hope, a truth of God, but it's not ours yet. Oh, it is ours. He paid for it. He willed it to us. It's our inheritance. But until it comes alive, for that sin, that situation, it lies dormant on the page. What will make it come alive? I believe, like Jeremiah said, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, yes, Lord, and I will restore your fortune. Wow. Yeah. Many times people believe that they're, into them, they're at the end of themselves. Yeah. And, they, and then many times people will say, well, I tried it. I tried the Lord. I gave him a shot. It didn't work out. No, the Lord knows. And he knows whether we're really to the end of ourselves. And when we do get to the end of ourselves, and I'm not saying that you're not to the end of yourself. That's between you and the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to make a point. I promise you the word of God says this. When you call upon me with all of your heart, then I will hear you and I will restore your land. Now, I want to go back. I'm closing with this, uh, but just give me a second. Uh, in the passages that we read at first, the strength, because this is connecting to access and it's also connecting to prayer is how I'm going to finish this up. Okay. Uh, Uzziah, we read about him first. He had the strength of a warrior, the soldiers. Remember the war machines? I thought that was pretty sick, pretty cool, right? I mean, you don't think of that kind of thing, right? I mean, I guess it was these big catapults, throwing in big old stones and arrows, big arrows, probably multiple arrows at one time. You know, wow, huh? Okay, and I mean, you, I, so, so there you go. He was a mighty warrior. He had soldiers, war machines, right? And then we get into Hezekiah. And he's trying to get everything right. He's trying to do things right. Now, they all make their mistakes, but I'm just trying to say these two guys were really good kings, okay? And, and, and Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be burned, but I wanted you to notice, I didn't say anything when I read it, but he said that will it's burned, they also offered praise at the same time. So one of the points that I wanted to make is this. That's a big part of the cross. The big part of the cross is that when Jesus died, he ripped the veil to give us access and that there's supposed to be prayer and praise interconnected with our faith and trust in what Christ has done because that's a big part of it because the Lord paid a price so that we could enter in. Amen? Amen. He sent letters to the people of Israel so that they would keep the Passover. That was a big deal. He was trying to reinstitute the Passover. Very important. Y'all know about Exodus and Egypt and how the Lord delivered them out with the blood of the Lamb. Amen. So he's trying to do the right thing. He got them to bring their tithes. He's trying to do it right. The word of the Lord says to do these things. Hezekiah worked hard to do practical things for war and preparation. He prevented the flow of the water. He had great military tactics. Armies need water, right? We talked about that. He rallied the troops. He told them the truth that God was able to give them the victory. Amen? Uh, and when it was all said and done, I want you to read this. Can you put this scripture up there, Haley, uh, Isaac, uh, 2 Chronicles 32? 2 Chronicles 32, verses 20 through 22. Now, you're going to probably read it before I'm even saying it, maybe. But what I want you to know is this. He did all that stuff. He reinstituted the altar. He put the whole burnt offering back on the altar. That is a type of the, of the work of Christ. That is a type of the cross. The whole burnt offering is a type of Jesus dying on the cross. I mean, he, he, re, he put the whole burnt offering out there. He told the people to praise. He told the people to bring tithes. He told the people to reinstitute the Passover. He told them all this. He gave good, encouraging words to the people. But none of that by itself is what brought the victory against King Sennacherib. I'm going somewhere with this. You can put it up there. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 30, verse 20. And when they heard that, that man saying all that stuff, when, when they heard that man talking trash about the Lord, and for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Next verse. 
And the Lord sent an angel which cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was come into the house of his God, they that came forth of his own bowels slew him there with the sword. His own kids killed him. The Lord, the Lord put a quick one. And it, and it all happened because of the prayer. And all, the prayer was the final act that caused everything to be moved into motion. Yes. Now, this is my point in all of that. Because whether it was yesterday, I don't know. I haven't slept too much in the last couple of days. But I do know this. Somewhere along the way, the Lord started showing me one of them things. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and whenever it was before I was listening to this Second Chronicles stuff. I listen to the Bible. I read the Bible. I try to get the Bible in any way I can. And I started to think when it hit me, I was like, "That's just what the Lord showed me about about missiles, bombs." It was like the idea at first was kind of like bombs on a shore when they would soften up a beachhead in war. <sighs> And what that was was the prayers of the saints. Yes. <sighs> Softening up a beachhead. Because see what it was, it was the kingdom of darkness that was being hit by the prayers. Amen. <sighs> and then I don't know if it was early this morning, I'm telling you, I woke up at 2.30 and been back to bed. But it's good because you get to prayer time and like that. Amen. And somewhere along the way, I started to see it was like a fortified city. And now the, now the, the bombs were hitting that. And at first it was like it had life, but then it became desolate. And it had, the buildings had holes and, it, and everything was about to crumble. And what the Lord was showing me was that was the strongholds of the enemy. And that the prayers of the saints were knocking holes in the, 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 the fortresses, in the strongholds of what the enemy had. And then whenever I read this passage of scripture and I began to realize, see, sometimes we grow weary in our praying. Sometimes we start to shrink back because we're not sure. We don't see what, what God is doing. But the, but the Lord, I believe he let me see that because he wanted me to encourage you that we can't stop praying. We can't stop interceding. We can't stop asking God to move in our family, in our lives, in this church. We need to keep asking God because I believe with all of our heart that he's putting, he's putting a chink in the enemy's armor. He's starting, to, he's starting to put holes in the strongholds of the enemy. Amen. He that listens to me. I, I talked to one guy a while back and he was like, man, I had this church filled with people and all of a sudden a spirit of Jezebel ripped through here and everything was gone and it was all gone overnight. Come on. Y'all heard what Sabrina said the other day. I'm telling you something that happened. That's how I met Solomon. That's exactly what that man told me. Spirit of Jezebel ran through here. When I preached at his church, he had seven people. I see video, I see pictures online where he had 65, 70 people. Great musician. Absolute phenomenal musician. Okay. People coming there for worship night every Sunday night, right? And, and the spirit of Jezebel come through here. She just ripped through and, and everything, everything gone. Then he said, he talked to a prophet. He said, what the prophet believes is that he stirred up a regional spirit. S stirred up a regional entity that was bigger than, the, than what he had preparation to deal with. And I'm just thinking to myself, all I can tell you is this. Is that if, if, the, if the Lord is waiting on somebody like me to handle it. No, no, no. This is the Lord's job. Amen. But the Lord uses intercessors. Yes, the yes, Lord uses the yes, people of God. Yes. And if you get tired of the brother, I'm the brother, saying too much about prayer, you're in the wrong place because I'm sold out. I know. There's been times in my life, seasons in my life, that I hadn't prayed like I was supposed to. I'm going to be real with you. But, but, but we all been guilty of that at some point in time in our walk with the Lord. But hallelujah, now is not that time, my friend. The days are growing darker. Amen. Y'all musicians, y'all can come forward. We're going to close this thing out in worship. I want to stay in worship a little bit longer. I want to pray. We got a good thing going. Let's keep on seeking the Lord. Amen. Let's keep on worshiping at any time we can. And, you know, uh, and, 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 and interceding and asking the Lord to move. And listen, I'm not trying to make a list of things to pray for, but my heart for the church is I pray for your families. I pray for your families. I pray for your children. I pray for your homes. 
I pray that the peace of God would enter into your homes. I pray that. And I, and I know that some of you are praying for my family. But look, I also pray that the Holy Spirit would con to continue to show up in our services, but even more powerfully. I believe that when we have more and more people that are online and in agreement and in unity of one mind and one accord, that, that and, and then we have one focus. And what's the focus? To exalt Jesus, to magnify the name of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit shows up. Why? Because he is the one that points people to Jesus. That's his ministry. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, there's no telling what can happen. People start getting healed. People start getting delivered. People start getting revelation of truth. The anointing is driven like an arrow into their heart. Bang! They start to understand the word of God. They realize where they've been in rebellion against God. God starts to change their lives. And then the next thing you know, they rise up. They go outside the walls of the church. And they start pray, come back over here. They pray. They witness the people. God doesn't move. Yes. It's called revival. And it starts in your heart. And it starts in my heart. Amen. And I believe that. I believe God wants to do that. Amen. So let's, let's worship the king. Amen.